Hi, this is your host Sapnil Bharatiya and welcome to TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Gary and Waters, CEO and co-founder at Provar. Gary and it's great to have you on the show. Good. Pleased to meet you, Swapna. Tell us a bit about the company. What does the company do and what problem you saw in this space that you wanted to solve that led to the creation of this company? Yeah, I mean, we were leading test automation company for Salesforce. Um, so we've been around about nine years. and We've got offices in UK, India, US. And, and realistically, I mean, the biggest issue that we saw nine years ago with Salesforce testing is it's a constantly evolving platform. Um, they're always bringing out new products. I mean, recently acquired Slack. I mean, it is a very changeable environment. And realistically, customers love that. It's rapidly bringing on new services, third-party packages. And actually, from a testing perspective, it just makes the traditional coded frameworks very expensive to maintain. Um, so customers don't maybe test enough, and they're employing developers to do it. So our unique approach is that we actually use something that Salesforce provides, something called metadata, that allows us to be very smart and deliver unbreakable test cases for large Salesforce implementations. Um, and we also have features to support sort of non-Salesforce, so we can do like end-to-end -end testing. And realistically, we're quite smart. We have called something called polymorphic, and that allows us to take a single test case that covers many scenarios, such as multiple users, data-driven, different browsers, different languages even. And I'd say the last thing we're particularly good at is just being very intuitive. So a lot of our users, and we get into this in, in the chat, I hope is that essentially they're not always technical. And so we have an approach where we have a no code approach where our users can create tests the same way as they use Salesforce and they can edit and execute tests in that fashion. So it works very well for our, for our space. I mean, if you look around the world today, every company is going through their own digital transformation and cloud adoption journey, which is kind of creating a unique challenge. First, not every company is a tech company, so they don't have in-house tech expertise for these technologies. And two, there is already a huge shortage of cloud skills. So can you talk about the role no code and no code is playing in helping folks embraced these latest new technologies without having to worry about getting the technical skill set that is needed for their businesses? So, I mean, I think it's um, really interesting, actually, from the, from the skills perspective and resourcing, is that the, the, these environments such as Salesforce are, are massively bringing in new people uh, and enabling new people who don't know the technology but they're upskilling them really quickly with, with great online training and sort of great ecosystem, encouraging people. I mean, we're, we're sponsored Supermums recently, which is trying to encourage mothers back into the workplace and, and Salesforce done a great job encouraging that. So I think you've got this situation where you have business users, you have less technical users who are able to declaratively make changes to Salesforce uh, and really add value to projects. But then I think that you also have lots of other scenarios which are required for any project where you need more technical people. So do you want to do integrations? Do I want to join third party applications? So that isn't something that you would want to sort of trust someone who hasn't got an IT background. So I do believe those two worlds are, are, are combining and it's a skill to make sure that we get the best of both worlds. And I'd say a lot of enterprise customers are realistically getting on the road of having things like center of excellences. Uh, and that allows them to really pull the architecture type of resource in a, in a, in a place where, you know, uh, companies can allow their business users to develop applications declaratively, and then rely on the center of excellence to be a fallback, to be a, we will not let you go wrong type of situation. Um, to, to make sure, because ultimately what I'm seeing in the Salesforce space is we start small and it gets bigger. Then we get regression. Then we get emails flying out. Then we really have a lot of danger because the problem with Salesforce is you genuinely can um, sort of make these changes that can torpedo a large part of the system you didn't know you were touching. So, so you need to have, you know, it's got this no-code elements, it's got the non-technical part to it, where you've got the expertise in what you want to do, but you also need to have these safety nets. You need to understand how you're deploying, you need to know how you're testing, and that you can't expect people who are coming in uh, with the business knowledge to sort of think about those things in the same way. 
when I was listening to you, I wondered if there is even further gap within the sales force environment. Uh, are there teams which are like highly technical and then others which are not technical depending on their department? And if yes, uh, what are you folks doing to bridge this gap between these kind of teams? Yeah, I mean, I think the, I mean, what we've got to do is look at what companies are trying to achieve firstly. I think that, you know, we want to have, uh, we're bored of traditional uh, um, sort of IT development. I mean, I go back to my days prior to Provar, I would work on these client server apps. It was all custom. We were deploying databases with the something above on top of that. I mean, these the no-code, low-code solutions are coming out there are phenomenal with regards to enterprises not having to invest in really technical stuff, such as data centers and monitoring of data centers and failovers. And no one quite understand how sort of difficult and painful, you know, pushing data around globally for, for enterprise is really quite hard stuff. So we get that for free. It's absolutely phenomenal. And, and again, to my mind, I think the key thing is, is, you know, we want this agile, quick to deliver approach, but it, new problems are presented, I feel, um, because of that approach. So you get lots of stuff for free, but you stay in time, the fundamental issue of testing making sure that you don't break things um, between releases. The, you know, it's dead easy to make a small change. Fantastic. The business are over the moon that you've delivered something in a day and it went live in a day. However, they're not over the moon if that change ultimately took down some very important end-to-end -end flow that was the payment system. So, so we want both. We want the security that it's working. We want to have the sort of less skilled people doing it. But we also, the, the skill is that we need to put those those pieces together. And I feel that, I think, what, what are we doing in particular, I think was part of the question, is we we, we bring the, the tool that can sort of rapidly build out tests and keep them maintainable. But in order to implement it, we bring a service that allows us to upskill, uh, again, the, the, the less technical people, the business users, how to develop these, these safety nets so they can go at speed, they can deploy regularly but each time not being you know release days being the, the night that people don't sleep because they're so panicky that something will break because last week it did when we did a deployment you know i genuinely feel you know important uh, things that we do is is preventing the information to people so they understand how things are changing and how how things are tested with scenarios that are covered but also evidence so that the production teams can have faith that these these guys can be trusted. I'm also curious, how were most enterprises managing the testing for low code and no code applications? And how are you folks helping them so they don't end up like wasting too much time on such tasks? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I mean, how I, I mean, I'm going to give you my opinion here. I mean, there's a large number of customers. It, again, I'm using Salesforce usually as my example that are adopting Salesforce. But the reality is, I think it's a bit of a journey. Um, again, I feel Salesforce is adopted in pockets across a big company by many teams, and it's not always coordinated. So typically what will happen is you make your changes, you put it live, it's phenomenal, you put it live within a week. Um, the problem then is they those teams are probably the guy who configured it is the person who's then testing it. Now that works for a while. And then what happens is you put a bit more on, you put a bit more on, then the users love it and you change it. Then there's more and, and then regression builds. So that model of just the same people testing it who configured it is going to break down, especially when they realize they're spending more time testing than not, or they're not testing at all, which is even scarier. So I then feel there's an evolution where they go, no, we need to test. And they bring in professional testers and they end up being manual. Then the problem evolves into a new problem, which is this thing that was really quick to deploy now has this really time consuming manual testing element where we can't make our changes quickly because we've got this week worth of regression. So I think that then evolves into, OK, we need to sort that out. And the sorting it out involves usually looking at something like a coded solution first. I mean, people uh, like the sort of open source approach to this, but and I think that's a great solution. It's just not a great solution for Salesforce. And the reason for that is because Salesforce is a really tricky app to test. It's got this sort of e um, technical nature to the way it renders its pages. 
in between releases of Salesforce releases, it looks completely different. So a lot of those tests just are, are unmaintainable. And that's the reason why you know, products like Provoc come along. Now, what we're doing is, of course, having that product that can that deliver a sort of regular maintainable solution to this. But we're also a QA company able to go out and advise and help and assist to really make sure these projects are successful in what they're trying to achieve. Not just develop a thousand test cases and guess what? Uh, you've got a thousand test cases to sort of maintain. We want the fewest number to reduce the risk to make sure that we can execute timely fashion to understand that we're deploying. And we frequently advise on just Salesforce changes. We do webinars about what Salesforce are doing in the next release. They do three releases a year that could fundamentally break customer solutions. Um, and again, we, 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 they need, a lot of our customers need that service to make sure they fully understand you know, what, what platform they're on and how to make the, the most of it. I mean, you folks have been around for a while uh, and some of these cloud native technologies is related with new. So can you talk about the evolution of testing and how it's different in the cloud native landscape versus let's say traditional IT environment? Yeah, I mean, I think if you put in apps on AWS or Google, I mean, you're very likely to follow similar mechanism to traditional software developments. And obviously you've got benefits to massive scale and scripted environments, but I mean, many of our customers still use Provo to test these applications too. I mean, we see that as standard testing, but what I think interesting about Salesforce is, I mean, firstly, Salesforce performs its own functional and non-functional testing for components they ship and which customers rely upon, which in reality means that there should be fewer scenarios for the end customer to have to test. And, and equally, when you're developing your own apps on Salesforce, you don't have control over the DOM, the rendering, the resource, the execution. So there's limitations about what the app can do. So again, you're more bounded. So I think the advantage for low no-code implementation is that you can prioritize the functional integration testing for what you have delivered. Um, so it's like a bit more sort of reducing the scope of, of what you need to do. Now, there's a big danger with that, in my opinion, because actually then the enterprise then just thinks, well, you know, I don't have to do all that testing. It's not my problem, but it is their problem because if it goes wrong, it's their business, their customers that are affected. So, you know, when Salesforce bring out their three releases a year, their weekly patches, the, rea the reality is the end customer does need to be conscious of, yes, you get certain things for free. Yes, they're bundled with your subscription. Yes, Salesforce are working extremely hard to forever make that testing better. And they've got loads of programs that we're involved with as well. But the reality is the overall responsibility has to be in ensuring that works. And again, that is a very good argument for doing having a regression pack that's meaningful, that has business scenarios that ultimately you run all the time and is very visible to the whole project and, and, and sort of stakeholders because they get that fundamental belief that, yes, we're making changes, but the core things that we do are continuing to work the same way as they always did. Thanks for sharing that. Now, if I ask you, do you have a playbook that we can share with teams, irrespective of how technical they are, in terms of how they should approach low-code and no-code testing? My tips for, for any testing is, mm -hmm. is to really understand the full end-to-end risk-based profile of what is in front of you, in my opinion. And I like to, if I was going to start afresh, I would sit down and look at if anything went wrong in this area, would I lose my job? Would my team be under severe pressure? I would start there. I would be looking at, you know, where you send outbound emails. So there's there's risk that those emails could get into the wrong hands or be sent from the wrong environments and those type of things. If there's any financial flows of data, if there's any PDF documents and the quote flows and those type of things. So I'd be really analyzing before I do anything, what are the business flows that mean something to me? Um, if there's something cosmetic and it ends up being on a screen that's more for the internal users and the box is in the wrong place, you'd fix that in an afternoon. No one needs to know. If there's business flows and you're really implementing something that goes from a retail website to a Salesforce backend to an automated pro API that's sent to a different system, I would be trying to come up with a strategy that, that combines API testing of those interfaces 
along with the sort of making sure that the critical flows of data and permutations of data, if there's any currency or date logic, uh, which can go wrong and trip things up, I'd be planning that. So th to my mind, the, the tips um, really are a case of, and, and this is something we do specialize with customers, is, is let's understand what we're trying to achieve because there's nothing I detest more than just creating tests for the sake of it or because they've read a functional spec and I need to be clever enough to find something and you end up putting that into your regression pack because your regression pack over time bloats and gets bigger and bigger and that's no not actually useful to people what we want to move quickly and to have agile projects is the right tests running all the time and giving us that immediate feedback so when I do change things I can get after it so it's really important right from the beginning we test the right things, uh, in my opinion, and and I love end-to-end -end testing. I just think that's the way forward. Uh, don't get sort of rat-holing down one app, test it to death, when realistically the one next to you can just do the smallest of things and everything falls over. Yeah, right. Thank you so much for taking time out today and share these insights with us. And I would really love to have you back on the show. Thank you. No, likewise, Swapna, thank you for your time. I thought your questions were excellent. I appreciate uh, it was, like you, like you promised, it was fun. Thank you.